Hello, I am Michael Sheehan. And I'm Johnny Sunt, joining you from Flow Bike Studios in Austin, Texas. And we're here with another episode of An Ianless Ian and Friends. An Ianless Ian and Friends. I, I rather like them. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm Johnny. I'm filling in for Ian. My beard is filling in better than his is in the Vander Beard Challenge. Hope you're uh, participating or following along at home in that. Yeah, uh, I have no comment on what you, uh, the two of you are doing. Anyways, let's get into it. Uh, we are going to give you a recap of the Cokeside World Cup, which just happened, uh, and then go into what is going on in the world of cyclocross, cycling abroad, and what we have coming up on Flow Bikes for you. So, first up, Cokeside. Uh, I have to say, the youth movement is continuing. In the women's field, we saw uh, an almost, I'm not gonna say Vanderpool-esque, uh, display of domination, but the way that Salen Del Carmen Alvarado was handling her bike across the sand in uh, Cokeside was, it was really incredible. She is a very, very good bike driver, and we've seen her have good rides before, but as a U23 rider, this is her first World Cup win. It's her biggest win of her career, and the way that she did it was pretty dominant, and you could just see that she not only was very strong, but she was very confident in her bicycle handling ability, more so than anybody else in the field. Yeah, and, and certainly uh, there was a very close race. These, ri these top riders are so evenly matched, and the top five all Dutch riders. It was a parade at the front of the Dutch, and they're all so young. Um, we saw another great ride from Lucinda Brandt, who is only her third race in, and she was, I mean, she had that one little crash on the last lap that probably prevented her from making it very close at the end. Um, and she was seen training earlier in the week with the Telenet Vavos team, with coach Paul Vandenbosch, with team principal Sven Nice. She had stated earlier before the season she needed to work on her technical ability. She's not a great sand rider, and she put together a really good ride there. But that top five was just packed right there until the end. Yeah, we are going to be seeing a lot more of Lucinda Brand. I'm really happy that she is in the development umbrella of Telenet Bowal Lions because she definitely needed a little bit of help with the bicycle handling skills. Everybody knows how strong that she is, and this is a big ride from her at Cokeside. Another big ride was Lawrence Sweek. He is having, uh, in what I think is probably his best season to date, he has not fallen off of the podium in the last five or so races and pretty much hasn't been off the podium all season. He got off to a flying start at Cokeside, uh, had a clean lead by about five seconds ahead of the rest of the field. Of course, Vanderpool did eventually charge up to him, but Lawrence Week held on to that really fast early pace, uh, had a pretty grippy battle with uh, Toon Ertz, and held on for second. And just watching him try to keep pace with Vanderpool, you know, a lot of riders, they blow up after they try to sit on Vanderpool's wheel for a lap. And Lawrence Week took it to Vanderpool. Still definitely not on the pace that Vanderpool has. Simply, nobody is. That's just uh, the fact of the matter. But best of the rest, by a pretty good margin, was Lawrence Week. And I see that this is a season where he's really stepping up. Uh, we've always seen good rides from him, but this is a little bit more. Indeed, he, uh, Lawrence Swick is, is very good on the technical parts, and, and, and Cokeside is a, is a course you cannot hide if you have a, a lack of, of fitness, if you have a, a, a lack of technical ability, or if you just have a bad day, it, it's unforgiving. And Swick has shown that he is riding very consistently this year. And, and uh, speaking of fitness right now, uh, we saw Tim Merlaire had a, a crash in the very first corner. He got taken off his bike. He was on the ground. He was sitting there holding his head. Uh, it looked like almost he, uh, like you would see a rider react to a crash in a road race. He didn't. He wasn't scrambling to get back on his bike. He holding his head. He he gets up. It, it, from our count, uh, 35 seconds from the time he hit the ground to him to even get moving again and straighten out his levers. Then he's limping a damaged bike to the pits to to get a, a working machine. And then on a course where there's usually only one line in the sand, he charges all the way through the field to ninth place. That was unbelievable. Towards the end of the race, when I saw that Tim Merlier had uh, broken into the top 10, I was dumbfounded because what he did at, in the first corner, I thought that he was just gonna quit. That was a total roadie move. When a roadie crashes, they just sit on the ground and wait for a team mechanic to show up with a new bike, new wheels get them rolling, sit in the caravan. There's no caravan in cyclocross. Every second you're on the ground is a second that you're gonna have to make up. And to get within a minute and a half or so of Matthew Vanderpool at the finish, uh, what, that is 
for my money, maybe the most impressive ride of the day. I, I, I agree. I, he is the Belgian national champion on the road. He's actually Matthew Vanderpool's teammate on the road on the Corn and Circus team. He's been enjoying some very good form. We've seen him on the podium the last few races on some of the smaller events. It looks like uh, Tim Merlier is making his move uh, this season right now. And then on the other side of having a good day despite hardship at Cookside, Ellie Isabet had a bad day at the beach. <laughs> Ellie Isabet did not have a fantastic day out. He is, however, still leading the World Cup standings because he just came out swinging, won the first three in a row. Uh, the big challenger, however, Matthew Vanderpoel, he is not really a challenger for the World Cup after uh, this being his first one. He is now sitting 17th overall in the overall standing, so not a contender for uh, to go up against Isabet in the series, I don't think. But Isabet is still going to have to watch out for the uh, likes of some of the other riders who are going to be closing in on him. Matthew Vanderpool, though, we saw him. He had a third row start. We are not used to seeing Matthew Vanderpool not start on the front row of a cyclocross field, but because of his late start to the season, he gets a bad start in some of these cyclocross races. And he made quick work of it. Yeah, it was, well, first of all, this year, the top 24 from the World Cup get the first two rows, not off of your UCI standing. So that is going to keep him shuffled back until he works his way up the standing. He's, he's making steady work of it. But not only that, he gets caught behind Tim Miller's crash. He was five riders from the back of the field. And at watching at home, I was like, okay, we're going to have, I wasn't worried about him making his way back to the front race. I thought we were going to have a really exciting race long charge to the field. And then he did it in one lap. Yeah. You know how long it took? Six minutes for Matthew Vanderpool to be ahead of everybody except for Lawrence Sweek, who was off the front. He then rejoined Lawrence Sweek by the end of the first lap and then dispensed of Sweek after about half a lap uh, more. So Matthew Vanderpool still just on another level. Nothing any of the riders can do about it. A master class by the Dutchman. If you are keeping track at home, that is 33 consecutive cyclocross wins. Um, when's it going to stop? No one knows. And not to take away, uh, for those who are huge fans of his technical ability, it, it just the level he's riding is so fun to watch. He didn't put a foot wrong. He was just... That course is so hard and so heavy. You, the TV doesn't do it justice with just how good he is right now. Yeah, and he said before the race that he had good legs, and he always has good legs. If he says that he has good legs, so whew, feel bad for everybody else. Uh, let's get into the news. Uh, today, Watt Van Art announced that he settled his legal battle with uh, legal battle with his former Rand Villems team. His former manager, Nick Nguyens, was suing him for a measly 1.1 million euros for terminating his contract early. However, Belgian court ru ruled in Van Aert's favor. Wout does not have to pay a penny. In fact, Nguyens has to cover all of Wout's legal fees. So that's a big victory for Wout Van Aert as he is still trying to recover from this nasty leg injury he sustained at the Tour de France time trial in Poe. Big weight off of Wout's shoulders. Hopefully that is going to help him get back on track, hasten his recovery. We are still hoping to see him come out and dabble in a little bit of this cyclocross season. That is his goal, at least. Yeah, and in other news, Pauline ferrand Prevot has announced her cross schedule. It'll be a little bit on the later side. It'll be January with a lead into the World Championship. But we know from watching this rider, when she does show up, she's always got to be in the conversation of for the win, for the for the victory in a bike race, for being in the mix, and she will be uh, starting her season January second at the EKZ Cross Tour in Switzerland. On the fourth of January in Troyes, France. Uh, the twelfth of January is that her French National Championship, and then the World Cups at Nomai and Hugerheide, and then the World Championships in Switzerland. And we are all looking forward to seeing this former triple world champion of. Uh, Road, mountain, cross. She's great. She's, she's going to be back in cross. We're all excited about that. All right, coming up, we have the next round of the David Vase series live on demand on Flow Bikes for our subscribers. And it's a new race, Urban Cross in Kortrijk. It is brand new course. And as the title indicates, it is in a urban center. This is really the first time that a cyclocross race has not been out in a field somewhere on the outskirts of town. It is 
right dead center in Kortrijk. It is uh, going over three bridges over their canal. It starts at the far end of the biggest bridge. What riders are going to just charge down to a roundabout that looks uh, about, I don't know, 400, 500 meters or so away. They're going to have to take a U-turn in the roundabout before they get onto the trail. They're going to hit beach. They're going to hit bridge crossings. There are a couple roundabouts on course. Really, we don't know exactly all the features. This is a brand new course, but we're all excited to see how it plays out. Yeah, and reminder, that is Saturday morning. I'll be here in the studio. Hopefully I can get one of uh, my friends to join me as well if we, uh, we're working around Thanksgiving schedules and whatnot. But it will be Saturday morning here on Flow Bikes. And this is round three of the Dave A.V.A. Trophy. So uh, Ellie Ezrabit still leads. He has uh, a minute 54 over Michael Van Torn out. And Lars Vanderhart is in third at 228. Matthew Vanderpool took a huge chunk out. and He skipped the first round at Koppenberg Cross. He didn't want to start his season on that heavy course. He took some time when he won round two. He's 355 back in the overall. Uh, on the women's side of things, Yara Kostelein leads Anna Worst but only by four seconds in the GC uh, with uh, Eva Lechner in third at 123. And uh, an on-form Celine Del Carmen Alvarado is fifth right now at 137. So there's some really tight racing in the women's race, especially with that 15, set, 15 10, 5 second bonus at the end of the first lap. And it'll be really interesting to see, obviously, like, like, like Michael said, this is a brand new course. We've never seen a race on it. So uh, tune in and uh, discover it with us. Yeah, I'm expecting a pretty hectic start. You know, the riders are always fast off the line in a cyclocross race, but they are urged on that much more in a David Vey series race because of that time bonus that lies at the end of the uh, first lap, Matthew Vanderpool, of course, is going to be charging for it. It could be a little bit crazy in that initial roundabout. And Johnny and I were just uh, talking about the women's field. Of course, the women's field in recent years, the story has been just how deep the talent is, how many riders are capable of winning. And it seems like every week we're just talking about a new rider who has put her name forward as a star, you know, at the uh, Last World Cup, it was Celine Del Carmen Alvarado. We can all expect her to be very good, but is she going to be the rider we're all talking about in the women's field? Time will tell. Yeah, I mean, the, the World Cup before that, it was Anna Marie Wurst won two days in a row. And then before a couple weeks before that, it was Yara Kostelein was dominant. And we just, these riders are so closely matched right now. It's, it's You just have to watch and see what happens. Yeah, and on Flow Bikes on Sunday, we have more racing for you. Uh, for our viewers in Canada, you can tune into the UCI Track Cycling World Cup, it is in Hong Kong, at least it is scheduled to be in Hong Kong. Hong Kong's a bit of a tumultuous place at the moment with pro-democracy protesters clashing against Chinese government officials. So we have been told that the situation is being monitored. They are planning on going on with the race as is. If it all goes uh, according to plan, you can watch a kind of highlight reel of the entire weekend's action all day on Sunday on Flow Bike. So please tune in and check that out. Uh, that's about it from us. Thank you very much for joining, and we'll see you at the action this weekend. All right, welcome to me and me here, filling in for everybody. Me and no friends. Yeah. Welcome to Johnny Has No Friends, coming to you live from the Flow Bike studio here in Austin, Texas. <laughs> 